Okay. Hi, and we begin this lecture to continue our discussion of uh, the Coriolis forces and Coriolis acceleration. But first, I would like to demonstrate a simple experiment which shows the forces of inertia in a non inertial system. Uh, so here we have three little balls which can uh, easily be deflected because they hang on, each ball hangs on a thread. And this ball is located exactly on the axis of rotation, and these two other balls are located some distance from the axis of rotation. And if we rotate if we rotate this object, then we may notice that the central ball remains hanging vertically. It, it's not deflected. And the other two balls are deflected. And the largest deflection is observed for the ball which is at largest distance from the uh, axis of rotation. So if we consider uh, this behavior of balls uh, from the point of view of an observer who is on this rotating body, then this observer who is sitting here will see that one ball is deflected by a small angle and another ball this one is deflected by a large angle. <coughs> How can this observer explain such a uh, behavior of balls? He will say that some force of inertia is acting on this ball and causes it to deflect. So the force of inertia is uh, felt by a person, by somebody who is here in the rotating reference frame. Uh, when we look at the same experiment from the laboratory reference frame, we explain the same behavior using different um, arguments. We will say that uh, the total force acting on this ball is the result of the force of gravity, which is directed downward, and the force of uh, tension of this thread. And the two forces <coughs> result in a net force, which which is directed to the center, to the central axis of rotation. And this net force causes the ball to, to accelerate, to have a centripetal acceleration. So if we view the same uh, phenomenon from two different reference frames, uh, we will use different explanations. In the laboratory reference frame, we don't need to introduce forces of inertia. We explain everything naturally. Uh, taking into account all the forces acting on the small ball. But uh, anyone who is in rotating reference frame will have to uh, introduce a force of inertia. No other way. He will have to introduce a force of inertia to explain the same phenomenon. And uh, now we continue discussion of uh, Coriolis acceleration. And the vector of Coriolis acceleration was found to be two angular velocity vector times velocity. So uh, this uh, Angular velocity is measured in, a, in an inertial reference frame or in laboratory reference frame. But this velocity v is measured uh, with respect to the rotating reference frame. What is the mathematics behind this formula? Which mathematical rules were used to derive this formula, to obtain it? 
The mathematics is very simple. It's all based on uh, rules of taking and uh, finding a derivative. Uh, let some function f be a product of two other functions, p times q. And let p be a function of time, and q also be an arbitrary function of time, so that f is also a function of time. If it's a function of time, we can find the first derivative of f with respect to time. The first derivative, according to the rules of uh, finding a derivative of the product of two functions, will be expressed in such a way we have to put a dot over the first multiplier and leave the second as it was. And then we leave the first multiplier without any dots and put another dot on the second multiplier. Uh, you know, do you know this rule of differentiating? So this is the mathematical rule which leads to the formula for Coriolis acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative. So in order to find the second derivative of such an expression, we put more dots here. So f2 dots, the second derivative with respect to time. And here, each term should be treated in the same way as we have already treated the mul this product of two functions. First, we put the dot over the first function and leave the second one as it was. Then we leave the first function as it was, p dot, and put the dot above the second function. That is the second derivative uh, of the first term here. And now we, we find the second derivative of the second term. That will be p dot q dot plus p q two dots. That is the second derivative, uh, the derivative of the second term, according to mathematical rules. Note that these two terms are identical, so that all this mathematical expression will be equal to p two dots q plus two p dot q dot plus p q two dots. That's the mathematical rule of taking a second derivative of function f if function f is presented as a product of two multipliers, of two functions of time. That's a simple mathematical rule. And the second term here actually is responsible for the Coriolis acceleration if under functions p and q, we understand something which is related to uh, rotating reference frame. So the mathematics behind the Coriolis acceleration is very simple. Here, that's the term which will give us the Coriolis acceleration in a particular case, when this formula is applied to a rotating object. So we assume some disk is rotating with angular velocity omega. And let there be some reference frame with unit vectors i, j, and k. And the reference frame is located on the disk. This reference frame is frozen into the disk so that this vectors i, j, and k rotate in the same way as the disk, uh, because this reference frame belongs to the disk. In this reference frame, any point on the disk will be described by some vector r, which is, in usual way, is i, x plus j, y plus k, z. That is in the reference frame associated with the disk. And the disk is rotating. So this is a non-inertial reference frame, a non-inertial reference frame. And now suppose this point A can move on the surface of this disk with some velocity. 
it can move itself. Suppose this is a bug which can is capable of creeping, of going along the surface of the disk. Somebody here, or some mechanism, which can move with respect to the surface of the disk. So if it doesn't move, it will rotate with the disk. But, but if it moves with velocity v, then in addition to rotation, it will be somehow displaced uh, with respect to this refer reference frame ijk. The reference frame ijk will be termed O reference frame. So this is a bug which can go uh, on the surface, which can move on the surface of the rotating disk. Such is the statement of the problem. Such is the physical condition which we want to study. So if we want to know the acceleration of this point A, acceleration is the second derivative of vector r, so that if we want to calculate acceleration, we have to calculate the second derivative of this vector. And uh, I will. it's obvious that all the terms here in this formula will be treated uh, in the same way. So it's enough to consider the first term. It's enough to consider the transformations and the derivative of the first term. And then the same formulas will apply to the second and to the third terms. So I will consider the transformation only of the x component of this vector, which is i x. And I will take the second derivative with respect to time. According to the general formula, if I have a function of two, uh, two multipliers, each multiplier depends on time, certainly. Vector i depends on time because it belongs to the rotating disk. It's rotating. It's changing in time. And x also is a function of time because this bug goes along the surface. So its coordinates uh, with respect to uh, O reference frame change in time. So x is also a function of time. So I can use this mathematics. And the result will be i2 dots x plus 2. And here I will have i dot times x dot plus i x two dots according to the rules of mathematical rules of taking a derivative. In in my case I want to take the second derivative. So I have just taken this formula and applied it to my situation. Absolutely the same mathematics, the same logics. And now we have to specify what is I what is i dot? Well, if i is a unit vector which is rotating about the axis, about the axis O with an uh, angular velocity omega, then we know that in this particular case, i dot is the vector product of the vector of angular velocity times i. And uh, the second derivative i two dots will be found by differentiating this expression with respect to time. And we have to put the dot over omega first. But we assume that omega is constant. It doesn't change. The rotation has no angular acceleration. We just assume this for simplicity. Certainly, it's possible to consider accelerated uh, rotation. But in this case, in this case, the final result and formulas will be more complicated. Yes, it's possible. But we, we begin with the most simple case, when omega is constant. And if omega is constant, then the time derivative of omega will be simply 0. So we don't differentiate it. And we have to differentiate only the second vector, which we know is rotating with constant angular velocity. And this i dot is known. We already know what is it. It's omega times i. So the first term here will be written in this way, 
omega vector product times omega times i and uh, x. Don't forget about the x coordinate here. And the second term, again, will be expressed using the same way. That will be vector product of omega times i. The same logic, the same formula for i dot multiplied by x dot. And the second and the last term here will be uh, acceleration, x component of acceleration of this bug, which moves with respect to the surface of rotating disk. But we again may simply assume, for simplicity, that the bug moves with constant velocity with respect to the rotating disk. So we assume that v is constant with respect to the O reference frame, which is frozen into the rotating disk and rotates together with it. So there is no acceleration of this point A with respect to O reference frame. So that this is, again, 0. This is 0. Now, if we consider time derivative of the second term here and the third term, we will obtain the same logic and the same formulas with just a uh, simple difference that vector i will be substituted by vector j, and x will be substituted by y, and so on. So the final result is easy to obtain. The final result for vector r, two dots, will have the same structure. Instead of x, we substitute y, y for x for the second term and, and z for, for, this, for the third term. So that will be vector product y times i x. I just repeat it to vector product omega i x plus the same thing with uh, the same thing resulting from differentiating the second term here. That will be omega times j. And here is y plus 2 omega times j and y. And plus the result of differentiating the, the last term in this formula, which will give us omega times omega vector k, z plus 2 omega vector kz. Now looking at this formula, we note that there are some terms which may be grouped together. For example, this one, and this one, and this one. And after such grouping, we may factor omega times omega. Or we may write it the first term. Let me do it in, in this way. We will put it like omega. And then I will have this ix plus jy plus kz and another round bracket. That is the result of the first uh, terms here in these three lines. If I open this round bracket here, I will obtain these three terms. And plus what will result from uh, treating this, the remaining terms here, that will be 2 omega times what? Uh, sorry. I have forgotten that here is the dot, x dot. Certainly, I have forgotten about it. Here is dot everywhere, certainly. So when I treat the remaining terms here, I will obtain 2 omega vector product by ix dot plus j, y dot plus k, z dot. What is here in these round brackets? 
obviously vector r. That is vector r. So the first term here gives us vector product omega times omega vector product r. And the second term will give us what? This is obviously the velocity. x dot is the x component of velocity of our bug, which moves with velocity v. So v can be written as i x dot plus j y dot plus k z dot. So, so that in this round brackets, we will have vector of velocity. So that the second term here will be 2 omega vector product by velocity v. And that gives us what? The first term is the well-known centripetal acceleration of point A. If it, was, if it was not moving with velocity v, a point A, if it was at rest in the O reference frame, rotating reference, if it was at rest with respect to the rotating reference frame, then the first term here will give us that centripetal acceleration, centripetal acceleration of point A. And the second term gives us what we call the Coriolis acceleration. So the first term is the acceleration, <coughs> a drag acceleration, and the second term is Coriolis acceleration. <coughs> uh, I wanted to discuss how the Coriolis acceleration uh, influences the motion of different bodies. For example, on the planet uh, Earth, where we live, the Earth is rotating uh, about its axis, and so we live in a non-inertial reference frame. The Earth is surely a non-inertial reference frame um, because it's rotating. And so there is an angular velocity of rotation of our planet, which can easily be calculated because we know the period of rotation, which is just 24 hours. And so as we live in, uh, on a rotating planet, we are in a non-inertial reference frame here. And so the Coriolis acceleration must somehow be present whenever anything is moving on the surface of our planet. Anything, whenever anything moves, it must experience Coriolis acceleration. Let's consider what happens. <coughs> I will make a picture of our planet. That's it. And that will be the equator. And that will be the axis of rotation. So if the planet rotates in this direction, according to vector omega, that will be this direction. Then this will be a north pole, and that will be a south pole of the planet, because the planet surface moves towards the east. So <coughs> what happens if somewhere here on the surface of the planet, somebody wants to fire a gun so that the projectile moves in this direction, northward, for example, in towards the north. We fire, we, make a sh we shoot a projectile to the north. What happens? The formula for Coriolis acceleration requires that we take a vector product of omega and vector v. In order to make a vector product, we must 
take this vector and draw the same vector here close to omega and uh, look at what <coughs> what happens if we uh, if we uh, rotate if we make this vector product <coughs> So it's obvious that the force of uh, the Coriolis acceleration will be, first of all, perpendicular to omega and also perpendicular to the velocity v, so that there will be some force acting on the projectile, and the force will be directed perpendicular to the velocity. It means that the projectile will not fly along the straight line. It will fly along some curved line. And if we shoot at, at a small distance, like one kilometer, two kilometers, this will be negligible. But if we want to shoot at a large distance, like 30 kilometers, I or if we launch a missile, which will be accelerated at some first few seconds, and then it will fly as at a ballistic trajecto trajectory, then a Coriolis force will act on this missile, and uh, it will be deflected from the straight line. If, it, if the missile flies to the north, it will be deflected from the straight line, and will be deflected to the east. The trajectory of the missile will go to the, e to the east. So imagine that here is the North Pole, and we fire a missile from here, and we want the missile to go to the North Pole with some velocity, we will discover that the missile goes along some different velocity, and it will be deflected. It will be deflected to the east, and we will miss the point. We will miss the point at which we target it, if we don't take into account the Coriolis acceleration. We will miss the point. Uh, the reason behind it is the velocity, which is associated with angular rotation, with, with rotation of the Earth. And this velocity <coughs> is given by radius r times v. And this velocity is directed along the parallel so there is a parallel, a parallel line, and the velocity on the parallel line is this radius times omega, and this velocity is directed here. And if you go northward, this velocity of the Earth's surface will be smaller and smaller. The largest velocity will be on the equator. And if you launch a rocket from the equator northward, then it will have large velocity and uh, initial velocity directed eastward. But as it flies to the north, uh, the points of the surface, of the Earth's surface under this missile, will move to the east, but with smaller velocity. And that is the reason why, why the rocket will miss the target. It will be deflected eastward. What happens if we launch a missile from the equator eastward with some velocity v. What will happen? And then in another situation, we launch a missile to the west. Two missiles on the equator. One is launched, launched to the east, and another is launched to the west. If we take a vector product, we understand that uh, the Coriolis acceleration will be directed perpendicular to the velocity. For the, for the missile uh, going eastward, the uh, direction of Coriolis acceleration will be out of the planet and for the for the velocity for the velocity uh, directed westward the Coriolis acceleration will be 
directed towards the center of the planet. It will look in such a way that a missile trajectory will be deflected. If it goes to the east, it will go higher than necessary, than we expected. And if the missile goes to the west, it will go lower. It will be somehow pressed down by some forces, by some Coriolis forces, uh, so that <coughs> the missile will, uh, which goes westward will go at lower trajectory than expected. And the missile that goes uh, eastward will go at higher trajectory than expected, again due to Coriolis acceleration, because the Earth is not a, uh, an inertial reference frame, not an inertial. Uh, the Earth is in, in, uh, in inertial, <coughs> non-inertial reference frame, because it's rotating. There are many other manifestations of uh, Coriolis acceleration. For example, if you consider a river which flows from the north to the south, then uh, Coriolis forces will act on it in such a way that uh, the forces will act westward. The forces of inertia on uh, every particle of water flowing in the river, if the river goes to the south, flows to the south, then the forces of Coriolis forces will act westward, according to this formula. And uh, uh, the surface of the river, will, the, the river itself will tend to turn to the west. And this situation continuing on and on for m thousands and thousands of years. Uh, results in the western bank of this river to be steep and the eastern bank to be shallow. So that if I uh, draw a cross section of the river, so this is the river, the cross section of the river, and it flows uh, to the south, then the eastern bank of this river will be shallow and the western bank will be steep. That is the situation for all the rivers flowing from the north to the south in the northern hemisphere. If you consider the same situation for the southern uh, hemisphere, then, the, uh, uh, then this steep bank will be on the, on the opposite side. So if you look at any river, for example, in the European part of Russia, and many rivers fly, many ri rivers flow to the south, then the western bank will be steep because, because of Coriolis forces acting in this direction. And so the, the river wants to, to go here, to go here, and for millions of years, uh, it goes here to the west, and the western bank is steep, and this, this bank is shallow because uh, all the ground from here, all the river was here a million years ago, and all the ground from here was somehow taken by the water and taken to the sea. So that's a um, geophysical consequence of Coriolis acceleration. And when you look at the banks of the rivers fl uh, flowing to the north or to the south, then you will see such an asymmetrical situation for the banks. Uh, for any river. But if the river flows from the west to the east, nothing like that happens. Or from the east to the west, nothing like that happens. No such different banks will be observed. Another interesting situation with uh, another interesting situation with um, Coriolis acceleration and Coriolis forces is a so-called Foucault pendulum. If I'm not mistaken, no, it's, uh, it must be <laughs> the French word, the French name. Yeah, the French name. I don't know how to, how to exactly write down the French names. 
seems to be so. Foucault, the French scientist who uh, considered this situation and solved this problem. So Foucault's pendulum is the pendulum which uh, is a mathematical pendulum as a headed body hanging on a thread. And if we start, if we start oscillations of this pendulum, then what happens due to rotation of the planet? Suppose the pendulum is started on the North Pole. Then it's uh, oscillating in certain plane. And as no other forces, external forces, act on it, the plane of oscillation will remain unchanged. It will oscillate in the same plane because this uh, pendulum will be a closed system with no external forces acting on it or the external forces acting in uh, vertical direction are balanced. So uh, when the pendulum is ro actually it's a system rotating about some axis, and in this rotation, as there are no external torques, then uh, according to the law of conservation of angular momentum, the angular momentum, that is the axis of rotation, will remain fixed in space. It will not change. But the Earth is rotating. Therefore, the plane of uh, pendulum oscillations will rotate with respect to the planet. Actually, it remains constant in time. But the planet is turning under the pendulum. And so we will ob observe that the, that the plane of this pendulum is rotating 24 hours the whole turn. During the 24 hours, it will make the whole turn. Well, after the small interval, we will uh, observe the Foucault pendulum, how it moves. And now five minutes interval.
So the Foucault pendulum located at the North Pole will make its oscillations in a plane which will rotate with respect to the Earth because r the Earth is rotating. So uh, the total period of rotation of the plane of oscillations will be given by 2 pi over omega. And uh, this is 24 hours. <coughs> uh, in this way, we can calculate the omega. But anyway, the total turn of the uh, plane of oscillations of Foucault pendulum will be 24 hours if it's located at the North Pole. If the uh, Foucault pendulum is located at some uh, latitude other than 90 degrees, so suppose somewhere here at this point, Foucault pendulum is somewhere here oscillating, then uh, the period of rotation of the plane of oscillations will be different because it will be defined by the component of the angular velocity along the vertical, local vertical line uh, perpendicular to the surface of the Earth. Uh, so the, mm, if the latitude is determined by angle alpha, that is, the equator has zero latitude and the North Pole has 90 degrees latitude. So if we uh, locate the pendulum at any angle, alpha, arbitrary angle, then uh, the omega, the, the projection of omega on the vertical direction will be omega sine alpha. And therefore, uh, the period <coughs> will be determined, the period as a function of latitude, will be determined by the same formula. But instead of omega, we must take omega sine alpha. It will not be 24 hours. 24 hours is true only for the pendulum located at the North Pole or at the South Pole. But if, it's at, uh, if the pendul pendulum is located at some arbitrary uh, latitude, then, then the period will be larger, because sine alpha is always less than unity. And uh, if the pendulum is located on the equator, then alpha is 0 and sine alpha is 0. And when you divide by 0, you obtain infinite value for the period. So at the equator, the uh, plane of oscillations will not rotate at all. It will not rotate if the uh, Foucault pendulum is, uh, is put on the equator. But at any other latitude, the Foucault pendulum uh, will have its plane of oscillations turning at such a period. Now we <coughs> we will observe the physical demonstration Dima, можно показывать, да? Of the Foucault pendulum, how it works. <coughs> so we have some a model of Foucault pendulum, uh, a body hanging on a thread. It may oscillate if we start such oscillations. And uh, if we rotate, yes, it's, if we rotate the table, that will be the imitation of rotation of our planet Earth. So the rotating, pla rotating table somehow imitates the Earth rotation. And you see that the plane of oscillations remains constant. But with respect to the rotating reference frame, the plane is turning. And there is a small hole at the lower part of this glass. There is a glass 
Можно показать им, да? There is a small glass uh, with a hole inside uh, at the bottom of this glass. And if we fill the glass with a uh, sand, then the sand will flow, uh, flow down from the hole. And such, uh, in such a way, we can observe uh, uh, this figure, uh, which is abs uh, actually drawn by a, a, a sand. <coughs> Uh, a small stream of fine sand. Можно еще что-то показать, да? Well, now we will show you another variant of the same experiment, another version of it. Again, we fill the glass with sand, a very fine sand, very small sand particles. That is, so you see another figure, another figure is drawn on the surface. And this is a demonstration of the fact that uh, the plane of oscillations remaining constant in time results in uh, such a figure if the surface is rotating. Actually, the surface is rotating because we are standing on rotating planet. And uh, what's the difference between the rotating planet and this table? The only difference is in angular velocity. The total period of rotation of this planet is just, of this table, uh, turntable, is just a few seconds, while uh, the Earth rotates with a period of 24 hours. But physical effect is the same. And when we have a larger angular velocity of rotation, it allows, uh, it allows one to observe the phenomenon just in a just in few minutes. If you observe the same phenomenon with the planet, it will take you hours and hours, many hours to, of observation. But the same thing will happen, the same thing. Uh, the main thing is that the uh, plane of oscillation remains uh, unchanged in an inertial reference frame, which is related, associated with distant stars. But as the Earth is rotating, then the plane will rotate with respect to the Earth. That's it. The main idea is demonstrated here. Now we will start a new topic. We will start a new topic, which will be vibrations or oscillations, oscillatory motion. Oscillatory motion uh, is very often encountered, encountered in everyday life and in different technical mechanisms. And uh, almost everywhere we have some oscillatory motion. Uh, the simple demonstration is a body hanging, hanging on the spring. So that's a demonstration of some oscillatory motion. Very simple. Actually, everything around us is oscillating. The sound which you hear is the oscillation of air particles. And different machine tools oscillate and vibrate as the machine is working. As the engine is working, different parts of the engine vibrate. And uh, vibrational motion or oscillation is very, very important. And uh, sometimes it's very dangerous because due to vibrations, uh, 
you you may you may damage your machine or you may damage your car you may damage it, the engine if it's vibrating hard so vibrations sometimes they are very uh, bad but sometimes they are good sometimes they are very useful and we use vibrations in vibrational and oscillatory motion in uh, radio electronics for radio communication and for for radio for emitting radio waves and sometimes it's very useful we, we can't live without it actually but sometimes it's uh, it's very bad for and sometimes we must eliminate vibration and sometimes uh, to the contrary we must increase the amplitude and the energy of vibrations so there are different situations in in different applications and therefore we must understand we must well understand the physics of oscillatory motion let's consider a body on the spring let this body be uh, capable of moving along the surface without friction and let it be let it have mass m and the spring will have a stiffness coefficient k and if the spring is in its neutral position then the body will be at rest and this position will be uh, assumed to have a zero coordinate and that will be x coordinate of the body let its center of mass have zero coordinate if the spring is not extended but if the spring is uh, somehow deformed then the force will act from the spring on the body the force will act and the force will depend on the deflection of the body that is on the coordinate uh, x <coughs> if the spring for example is compressed then the deflection will be negative because x is positive in this direction and x is negative here the deflection the displacement of the body will be negative from its zero position and in this case the compressed spring will act with a force directed in the positive direction therefore <coughs> the force is always minus kx if x is negative then the force is positive and vice versa if the spring is elongated then the displacement of the body will be positive but the force acting on the body will be negative it will act in negative direction so that the force is always proportional to minus x where x is the displacement of the of the body and the coefficient of proportionality is called a stiffness coefficient of the spring the stiffness of the spring is just a coefficient which is characterizing the spring uh, so that this is the law describing the force of interaction between the spring and the body actually the force of interaction due to Newton's second law is the mass of the body times acceleration of the body if no other forces act on this body if no other forces but the spring only the spring is acting on the body then the only force acting will determine the acceleration of the body the acceleration is directed along the x-axis therefore acceleration will be expressed as second time derivative of the x coordinate certainly there are other forces acting on the body for example the force of gravity directed downward and the force of reaction of the surface which is directed upward but these two forces balance each other they cancel each other their vector sum is zero so in order to find the vector sum total vector total net force acting on the body we must take into account only the force acting uh, from the spring because all other forces <coughs> cancel each other so we obtain such an expression 
if we consider these two terms, we will write the equation mx two dots plus kx equals zero. Such as the differential equation defining the motion of a body, because the x coordinate is a function of time. X here is some unknown function of time which we must find. The coordinate of the body is a function of time because the body moves to and fro under the action of the spring, and x is a function of time here. You have not yet studied the subject of differential equations. You don't know how to solve uh, differential equations. A differential equation is such an equation where uh, we have an unknown function, which we must find. We don't know this function. We must find it. But along with the function, there are some derivatives of this function. A second time derivative, maybe the first time derivative, etc. So along with the function, we have its derivatives. And such a, an equation with an unknown function is called a differential equation. <coughs> there are many ways to solve differential equations, but the most <coughs> popular and most practical way, way to solve it is to guess the solution. So we will guess the solution, and we will try to find this function in the following way. Some amplitude times sine omega t plus phi. Do we have the right to assume that this function may be a solution to this equation? Certainly. Why not? We may assume anything. But after assuming, we must prove that this function is the correct solution of the equation. It may not be true, certainly. If we, how to, how to, uh, how to check this function if this is a solution? We must take this function and substitute it for the solution, substitute this function for x, and also we have to find the derivatives of this function and substitute the second derivative for x with two dots. So x with one dot, if we differentiate with respect to time, a as an amplitude will remain unchanged, and omega will, will be here as a coefficient, and sine will turn into cosine. And here, what remains will uh, the argument of this tree kinematic function will remain unchanged after differentiating, differentiating, after finding the first derivative of this function. If we find the second derivative, we must differentiate this expression for the second time. And that will be a constant coefficient, which, which remains unchanged. And another omega will come here as the factor. So we will obtain omega squared. And cosine. When, when you take a derivative of cosine, you will obtain minus sine. So minus sine will appear here, minus sine of the same argument. Now we will substitute function x of t here, and we will substitute the second derivative of the same function here and check if the equation will satisfy. Let's do that. So we have m second derivative, which is minus a omega squared. So that will be minus m a omega squared sine omega t plus phi. That is the expression for the second derivative, which I substituted for x double dot minus a omega squared sine of this argument. 
What else is there in the equation? Plus k function x plus k. And for x, I must substitute this expression. That will be a sine omega t plus phi. And all this must be equal to 0. I equate this expression to 0. So I have taken the original differential equation, which was obtained from the second Newton's law. As the second Newton's law certainly applies in this case, then this differential equation is correct. I'm sure that this is correct. I'm sure that if I substitute a correct solution here, a correct function x of t, then I will obtain 0. But is it really so if I substitute the function sine into this equation? Is it always 0? Let's look here. Sine will be canceled because sine uh, is generally not 0. So we can divide the equation by this sign. And also, amplitude a will cancel. And what remains here? Minus am omega squared plus k equals 0. Is it always so? Is it always correct? No, absolutely not. Uh, this is the stiffness of stiffness coefficient of our spring. And this is the omega, the frequency, with which the function x is changing. So in order for this equation to satisfy, omega squared must be equal to k divided by m. In other words, omega must be equal to square root k divided by m. Only under this condition, only under this condition, this equation will satisfy. That will be 0. And therefore, only under this condition, this function will be a solution to the second Newton's law, which is the differential equation. So a trigonometric function sine will be a solution only if omega is determined by the stiffness coefficient, spring stiffness, and the mass of the vibrating or oscillating body. So if we ask a question, is such a function a sine of omega t plus phi a solution to this equation? The answer is generally no. But this is certainly a solution if omega is chosen to be such a number. Then this function sine will be a solution. Can we, so we, we are not, uh, we are not free to choose any omega. No, only such omega. And then that will be a solution. Can we, cha can we choose any, any phi? Yes, certainly. Phi has canceled. So we may choose any phi in this formula. And, and then it will be a solution provided omega is correct. Can we choose any amplitude a? Yes, certainly amplitude canceled. And therefore, we may take any amplitude. And this function will be a solution, provided omega is defined by this square root. So this is certainly a solution uh, to the equation with, uh, with the understanding that the amplitude may be any number, arbitrary amplitude. And the phi may be arbitrary number, but omega may not be arbitrary. Omega is definite number, should be definite number, in order for this function to be a solution to this equation. Now there is another question. Are there any other function which is a solution to this equation? Yes, certainly. This is not the single solution. 
not a single function. There are other functions which may be a solution, solutions to this equation. Which are the functions? For example, if we take cosine instead of sine, if we take cosine here, then after first derivative, we will get minus sine, and after second derivative, we will get cosine again with minus. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if, you, if you carry out all these calculations with the initial function equal to cosine, then you will obtain the same result. Everything cancels, and such a condition is imposed on the omega. So if you take a general function in such a way, some first coefficient sine omega t plus phi plus some second coefficient a2 cosine omega t plus phi, then this function will be a solution to this equation. If you take this function and substitute it here for x, and if you differentiate it function once and then twice, and take the second derivative and substitute it here, and carry out all similar si situ uh, calculations, you will, you will find that this function is also a solution to this differential equation. Where amplitudes a1 and a2 are arbitrary, and uh, this number phi is also arbitrary, arbitrary, but omega is definite. It's defined uh, by such square root. It depends on the stiffness of the spring and the mass of the body, and the mass of oscillating body. The larger the mass, the larger the mass, the smaller is the frequency. And the, if you take a larger stiffness, a spring of larger stiffness, then you will have larger frequency of vibrations. So this coefficient a is called an amplitude of oscillations. Omega is the frequency of oscillations. And phi is the initial phase of oscillations. Why initial? Because actually the phase of oscillations is the argument which is here in the round brackets. That is called the phase of oscillations. But the initial phase will, will be obtained when, when time is 0, the initial moment of time. If time is 0, then the initial phase will be equal to phi. So phi is the initial phase. All the argument in the round brackets is called the phase of oscillations, and omega is the frequency, and A is the amplitude of oscillations. As far as this solution is concerned, there, is, there are many things which can be discussed. But one important thing is that we have determined the omega. Yes, it's determined by the square root formula. But we have not determined the amplitude and the initial phase. How to find these numbers? In general case, these can be arbitrary numbers, but in any particular motion, in any particular oscillatory motion, the amplitude and the initial phase are defined by initial conditions. For example, the amplitude will be defined by, by me. I, I define the amplitude, because when I start oscillations, I can, I can start it with small amplitude or I, I can pull the ball at a larger amplitude. So the amplitude is determined by, a, by an external actor which starts the oscillations. The amplitude is determined by initial conditions. 
also the phase, the initial phase phi is determined by initial conditions. What does it, what does this number actually mean? If you draw the graph of this function, x as a function of time versus time, then you will see the sine or harmonic oscillation is some function like this. If time is 0 and the oscillation starts from this point, then the initial phase is 0. But if I start initially the oscillation with some initial velocity, that is, I will start uh, if I start the oscillation at some different velocity, for example, if I start the oscillation at this initial moment of time, then the oscillations will start with zero velocity but maximum possible, uh, maximum amplitude, maximal deflection. Can I do so? Yes. I can take this ball and pull it downward and release it without initial velocity. That's it. It will start oscillating at maximum displacement, maximum initial displacement. The initial displacement will equal the amplitude. That is the amplitude, this point. And in this case, if it starts with initial zero initial velocity, then this function will be cosine omega t plus 0. Or it may be presented as sine omega t plus 90 degrees. Anyway, either this way or that way. If I start it with 0 velocity, but I can start oscillations from this point, it means that the deflection, initial deflection will be 0, initial uh, position x position, initial x value will be 0, but the initial velocity will be non-zero. Can, can I start such an oscillation? Certainly. I take the ball, and I just initiate the, start the oscillations in such a way that the initial velocity is non-zero. That's it. Initial velocity was not 0. So there are different possible ways to start the oscillation. I may pull the ball down and keep it at rest, and then with zero initial velocity start the oscillations. That is, the initial velocity was zero, but the initial amplitude was, was large. Or there is another possible way. I can, I can have this ball at rest and no initial displacement, but the initial velocity non-zero. And the displacement, maximum displacement, will occur sometime later. So at this particular case, initial displacement is 0, but the initial velocity will, was non-zero. I pushed the ball. And then the maximum displacement will take place at some later time, and then the oscillations will go according to this law. So that uh, the initial phase and the amplitude are determined by initial conditions of oscillations. How do I start the oscillations? Or at which moment of time I will start measuring time? I can start, uh, I can start measuring time at any, at any moment in time. Any moment may be chosen as the zero point. That will define the initial phase phi. And it's up to me to, de to decide which, which point in time can we choose as the zero point. It's, it's, up to, it's up to you if you are starting the oscillations and if you are measuring the oscillations. Uh, and if you start the clock in order to measure the time, you can start the clock at any moment of time. So if you choose different initial moments of time, that will influence the initial phase. Or if you start oscillations at different uh, 
initial velocities or different initial amplitudes, initial displacements, that will determine the initial, that will determine the amplitude. Where is the velocity? Velocity is x dot. So the amplitude of velocity is here. Velocity as a function of time for oscillating body is x dot as a function of time. And that will be, that is, that is written here, a omega cosine omega t plus phi. And the maximum value for velocity is a omega. And the velocity varies from 0 at this point to maximum velocity at this point. So the velocity is also a harmonic function. It's also oscillating. But this is the amplitude for the velocity, the maximum value of the velocity of vibrating body. And uh, the second derivative of x is the acceleration of acceleration of the vibrating body. And the maximum acceleration, maximum, maximum uh, quantity of acceleration is this uh, coefficient, which is a omega squared. That is the maximum acceleration of vibrating body. So after this preliminary deliberations and definitions, what is the amplitude? What is the amplitude velocity? Velocity amplitude. And what is the acceleration amplitude? And what is the initial phase, etc., etc.? And what is the frequency of oscillations? All oh, this is very important, but this is just the first step in studying accelerations, uh, <coughs> oscillatory motion. I will consider another type of oscillating body. Another type of oscillating body is a ball, is a body which hangs on a thread. And I can deflect it and start oscillations. Or in another way, I can leave it at, the, at rest. The velocity is 0. And I can push it and start oscillations by imparting the initial velocity. So there was no initial amplitude, no initial deflection, but there was an initial velocity to this body. So what is the period of oscillations of such a body? If the length of this thread is L, and this is the small body which hangs uh, here on the surface of the Earth, what will be the, what will be the period of oscillations? So if we consider the oscillations of this body, it moved, moved here. Uh, OK, let's finish, this. let's finish this consideration for oscillations of such a body, which is called a mathematical pendulum. A mathematical pendulum, just a small body hanging on the thread. And we will start the next time with this problem. We will consider the mathematical pendulum next Monday. And the day after tomorrow, on Wednesday, I will show you how to solve correctly all the problems uh, from the written test. Uh, we will discuss the solution of the written test. No, no single student was able to solve all the problems of the test. No, no student got the maximum five points. Everybody made mistakes somewhere. Somebody made uh, minor mistakes, a few mistakes, but some, some students turned out to be unable to solve nothing, unable to solve even a single problem. Some students were unable to, to solve. That's, it. That's why I decided to devote the next <coughs> lecture on Wednesday to discussing the solutions. <coughs> 
solutions of the written test. So on this point, let's finish this lecture.